Okay. Uh, now make one more adjustment here. It's a little tricky navigating multiple devices, our connected world, but we are there. And so thank you to Ben Kahn, a reporter at Broadband Breakfast, who called that to my attention. Let me just back up a second because I don't want people to miss out on this important context that, that we just spoke about. Uh, we're joined here at our Broadband Breakfast for Lunch event with uh, Scott Woods. Scott is the um, Senior Broadband Program Specialist with Commerce Department's National Telecommunications and Information Administration. And he is um, uh, also uh, the principal uh, liaison with uh, the Broadband USA program that enables um, the interaction between commerce and external stakeholders. And this is so important right now because Congress has just passed and President Biden has just signed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which brings $65 billion in funding to uh, broadband infrastructure. So we're gonna be excited to hear a little bit about uh, Scott's inside the agency perspective on broadband. Uh, we are also joined by Jace Wilson. Welcome, Jace. Jace is the founder and CEO of Ready uh, broad, or Broadband.Money, which is a software data and financial services firm that helps local ISPs connect more people to better broadband. So without uh, any further ado, and thank you for your patience on our technical difficulties, let's turn it over to Scott to tell us a little bit about your perspective on the IIJA. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I do join you. Uh, again, I have a, a new title, which uh, when we were doing the planning of this, I uh, used to be the senior uh, broadband program specialist. I join you now as sort of the new director of the Office of Minority Broadband Initiatives. Nice. Um, and so I, I welcome and uh, thank you yes. for having yeah. me today. So it is in that vein that I am here to you know talk about the, our grant programs, the ones that we launched this year, um, as well as our prospective programs that we have under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, and there's exciting new opportunities across the spectrum uh, in this area of broadband, digital inclusion, access, and connectivity. So without further ado, if we can bring up the presentation and I'll walk through this at a very high level and then we can address questions that you may have. Nice. And let's go to the first slide, please. Here we go. So first off, you know, again, we're at the Department of Commerce, we support the Biden administration's agenda uh, and our partner federal agencies across the federal government uh, to ensure that every American has access to affordable and reliable broadband uh, and also has the skills and opportunities to participate in the next generation digital economy. But we're gonna do that principally in, in, in four ways or four pillars. We're gonna deploy broadband infrastructure to communities with the greatest need we're gonna support job creation and workforce development by ensuring that all Americans have broadband devices and digital skills that they need to compete and be successful. Uh, we're gonna collaborate with states, with tribes, with private industry, with philanthropy and other federal agencies to effectively expand broadband access and digital inclusion. And then finally, we're gonna hopefully use data uh, to inform those policies and investments. So, broadband data, mapping, visualization, all of that's going to be key uh, in how we roll out these programs <clears throat> in, in the future. Can we go to the next slide, please. So we launched three grant programs this year under the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Uh, and so we did the Tribal Broadband Grant Program this year. Uh, that was almost a billion dollars. We received more than 300 applications uh, and $6.5 billion in funding requests uh, we also had the Broadband Infrastructure Grant Program, it was $288 million in that program. We received over 230 applications uh, and more than $2.5 billion in requests. Uh, and then for the majority of this year, I've had the pleasure to lead the CMC team, the Connecting Minority Communities Pilot Program, 
Um, we just closed the application uh, date, received applications from that program, $268 million. And I don't want to get ahead of the press release that's coming, but we had more than 200 applications and more than $800 million in requests. So in the grant programs that we launched this year, we see that there is a demonstrable need across all of the communities across the country. Uh, and so we think this is a good foundation, uh, if you will, for the infrastructure uh, investments that are coming under the IIJA. And if we go to the next slide, there it is. Uh, and so we know that under the uh, Infrastructure Act or the Infrastructure Investment uh, and Jobs Act, uh, the Congress and the administration has invested $65 billion overall to address the uh, digital chasm, if you will, that exists in this country. It's going to break down at NTIA as follows. We are going to administer approximately $48 billion of this new funding, or 42 and a half almost in the BEAD program, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, uh, $2.75 billion for the Digital Equity Program, uh, the Tribal Program, I'll talk a little bit about that, it'll be $2 billion, and that's actually going to uh, be a fund in addition to the program that we launched this year. So we're adding additional money to that program. And then finally, a middle mile program, about a billion dollars um, to focus on building up uh, middle mile infrastructure. And so if you look at the overall federal landscape as well, the FCC receives uh, um, $14.2 billion uh, to replace the EBB program, the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. Uh, the USDA will receive $2 billion uh, to the Rural Utility Service Program for their telecommunications portfolio. Uh, and then $600 million has been uh, allocated to private activity bonds, where uh, state and local governments can use private activity bonds for rural broadband access. So there is a lot of excitement. There's a lot of funding, uh, but there's a lot of work to do as well. Uh, so briefly, I'm going to just give a very high level of the four programs that we will be responsible for launching this year uh, and then available to take any questions that you may have. We can go to the next slide, please. So it's really quick overview of the BEAD, as we call it, uh, the Broadband Equity Access uh, and, de and Deployment Program. Uh, it's primarily for states and, and territories based on a formula. The program objective is to address, uh, to close the availability gap. Uh, and Congress has found and has tasked us to ac access to affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband is essential to full participation in modern life in U.S. states and the communities. So our program priorities are unserved locations, which no access to 25-3, uh, underserved locations, no access to 100, uh, under 20, so 100 megabits download, 20 megabits upload, and then community anchor institutions without gigabit access connection. So those are going to be the program priorities uh, for, for that program. Uh, other key features, are good. we're going to prioritize uh, persistent poverty, high poverty areas. Uh, we're going to prioritize speed uh, to build or, or launch or deploy the proposed network. Uh, and we need to uh, track record of demonstrated record of compliance with federal labor and employment law. So all of this is going to go into uh, the program that we're going to launch uh, to the states and the territories. Other key features here, just quality requirements, uh, and you'll get more information on this when the notice of funding opportunity comes out. Uh, but specific network requirements include speeds, right? So the speed target is going to be at least 100 megabits download, 20 megabits upload, right? That's the floor. All right, uh, and then we'll talk more about the policy implications of, of decisions that happen, you know, more than that. Uh, there's a matching uh, requirement where eligible entities must ensure that they or their subgrantee provide at least 25% match uh, unless the waiver, a waiver is granted. And then there's a low uh, cost plan requirement for the B program. And again, much more information will be forthcoming on the notice uh, of a uh, funding availability or funding opportunity that the agency will issue in the upcoming months. We go to the next slide, please. A little bit about the digital equity program. So the Digital Equity Act creates three sequence programs to promote digital uh, inclusion and equity. The funding pool, as I said, is almost $3 billion. And again, the goal, the program objective 
is to support the closure uh, of the digital divide and promote equity and inclusion so that individuals and communities have the information technology capacity that is needed for full participation in American life. And so this outlines the program's priorities amongst vulnerable communities. Uh, but I really want to focus some time on how this program will be sequenced, because it's very important uh, for states to understand this. Right? So the first step is a state planning grant program, where we're going to allocate $60 million to that effort. Uh, and that is for states to really get into the planning and data collection and really understanding the needs of communities in their states and jurisdictions. Uh, and that's followed by a state capacity grant program uh, was almost 1.4 billion uh, for states to implement uh, projects that they find uh, through their planning. And then that'll transition into a more competitive program, which will provide an additional 1.25 billion uh, for states to compete for those additional funds over five years um, once the implementation grants begin and those are, are awarded. So step, states have to go through specific steps for the digital equity, have to go to the planning, have to do the implementation, and then uh, we'll also have additional funds available uh, to address digital inclusion, access, equity um, as we move forward. Um, and then really briefly go to the next slide. And as I touched on in my introductory remarks, the tribal program uh, essentially uh, provides $2 billion of funding into the tribal broadband program that we launched this year, right? So that's the essential, it adds that money into that. But it relaxes uh, several requirements uh, of that program. So now eligible entities have up to six months to submit applications, 18 months to commit the funds to projects, and then four years to fully complete or expend, uh, to expend the grant funds not necessarily complete the projects, but to expend the grant funds uh, to ensure that those projects are on track uh, to, to completion. So this slide provides a, a brief overview of, of, of that as well. And then finally, if we can transition to the final slide, which is the middle mile program, and that is a billion dollars allocated to uh, support middle mile infrastructure. Uh, the funding pool is there. Again, it's gonna be a competitive grant on a technologically neutral basis. Um, and the, uh, the objective is to encourage expansion and extension of uh, middle mile infrastructure to reduce the cost of connecting unserved and underserved areas. So again, under the idea that if we build out middle mile infrastructure in a robust manner, you know, th those connections, if you will, serve as catalysts to last mile development, last mile deployment in unserved and underserved areas. Uh, so for the middle mile program, there are really important program priorities. Uh, eligible entities must meet at least two of five conditions to be eligible. And those are outlined here. You know, adopt fiscally sustainable middle mile strategies. And again, the NOFO will have <laughs> much more details on what this means. So I'm just going to be four, four NOFOs or, or four NOFOs one. for okay. each one of the programs. Right. Uh, and let me wrap up here just, you know, highlighting these five program uh, conditions, you have to meet at least two. Uh, and then you also have to uh, agree to prioritize connecting to unserved areas, uh, to non-contiguous trust lands, or offering wholesale carrier neutral service at a reasonable rate, uh, and then offer interconnection in perpetuity with, with reasonable rates and terms. So basically on a commercially uh, you know, uh, market rate basis, so no, no, in, no in inflation of of rates in there. And as I stated, you know, the NOFO that we'll issue on each of these uh, programs will have much more detail into the requirements of each of the programs uh, and the program teams at NTIA will uh, do a fantastic job of uh, sharing information and providing outreach and technical assistance so that the states um, and uh, everyone else involved, stakeholders, uh, will know the requirements and know exactly uh, what they can and can't do and what they should and should not do to move forward with these programs. So I know that was a lot of information. I just tried to go over it really briefly, uh, but I do thank you uh, and appreciate the opportunity to be here with everyone today. Awesome. Thank you so much. And and, and we want to get Jason here just, just in a moment, but but I, I want to just quickly ask, 
obviously we try to avoid an ac acronyms here. And so the NOFO, it, it, I got tripped up because I was thinking notice of funds availability, but it's really notice of funds opportunity, right? Every, notice every of funding years, opportunity. Washington needs to change its acronyms, right? It used to be a NOFO, now it's a NOFO. No so, so, so when can we expect the first of those four? <laughs> That's the magic question. Uh, I think that there's, uh, I think by law, we have to get it out in a certain time frame. Uh -huh. you know, the teams are, are, are working on, on, on those and uh, we'll update everyone on our website and obviously with our outreach, um, you know, as soon as we have right. uh, target dates on those. Right. And, and I, I certainly want to drill into each, each of these or at least several of these programs, but, but do you have just some sense, because you talked about the sequencing and how important that was on the Digital Equity Act, uh, is, there, is there one that's kind of more sort of up, up to bat than the, than the other uh, NOFOs? No, each, if you look at the, the, um, the actual Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, they each have their own requirements that we have to go through mm -hmm. to uh, implement and deploy. I think right now what we're engaged in uh, is our outreach yeah. um, and, and really stressing collaboration amongst all of our stakeholders and partners, right? And I wanna say this, there's no way the federal government can do this by itself. We need collaboration and partnership yeah. with the private sector, with philanthropic organizations, with communities, uh, with state and local governments, right? We need everyone pushing and pulling in the right direction uh, so that we can address this, this monumental task that's before us. So right now we're engaging in listening sessions. Um, we're actively listening to stakeholders, getting feedback and best practices. Uh, and then hopefully there'll be a opportunity to provide uh, input on the request for comments that's forthcoming. Yeah. So that'll be coming before the NOFO comes out. Uh, and then we'll be uh, rocking and rolling, if you will, from there. Well, partnerships is really crucial. And again, just one quick thing before we move over to Jace. You mentioned, of course, the broadband infrastructure deployment grants, which is actually a specific requirement that there's a collaboration. Isn't that correct, Scott? That is correct. It's a requirement of collaboration between uh, covered partnerships and a service provider. And a covered uh, partnership it, is? It's generally the uh, local division of the state or jurisdiction of the state. Right. So the state or a, a recognized uh, jurisdiction or entity of the state. So generally means some political subdivision. Yeah, county. <laughs> yeah like, like speed dating or... or, or, or <laughs> I don't know about that. I've been, <laughs> I'm a little older than the speed right. dating <laughs> Great. Well, Jace, tell us your perspective on this. You, you've obviously had a fascination and a great involvement with uh, a broadband industry and now with the broadband funding process. So yep. what, what is broadband money and what are some of your thoughts about what Scott has laid out here? Well, I think that Scott's laid out that he's a very tough act to follow uh, <laughs> and I, I feel woefully inadequate. I'll try my best to uh, hold the act up here. And uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Drew, for having me on. And thank you, Scott, for uh, all you're doing to connect communities and get folks access. You know, you and your team have, have worked, I know, around the clock for a lot of months to make this happen, and it is appreciated. So, um, and also, congratulations on your on your new role. That's awesome. Uh, Jace, may I ask you just speak yeah. up a little bit, or, or maybe we can fire up the microphone here? But uh, sure, I'll take a moment. Sure. Let, let's do that. Let's get I, I tend not to be so loud, so you, you don't want me to go loud. I don't here we go. <laughs> Hello. Check check. Hello? We good? Well, it's not surrounding It's on green. How about that? Just shout shout right into it. Let's see if we get Hello. a little more a little more volume out of that. Let's see if we can do this. Hello? Check, check, check. Hey. There we go. Quick recap. Thank you, Drew, for having me. Uh, Scott, you're a tough act to follow. Congratulations on your awesome new role, and thank you for all that you and the uh, folks at the NTIA crew are doing to help communities connect. So, yeah, I'm Jace. I'm with uh, Ready, and Ready helps uh, you know, local broadband providers connect more people to better services through software and data and access to capital. And earlier this year, we launched Broadband Money uh, with a single mandate, and it's to help make sure that local providers and the people that help local providers connect more people to better services have the tools and resources they need to get their share of the 65 billion bucks that scott and his team have helped to create 
uh, because we believe that the local providers and the people that help them are the ones that are going to roll up their sleeves and partner with communities and actually get the job done and invest in uh, the, the bee that matters, which is broadband, instead of the bees that the uh, incumbents have historically spent money on when they get grant proceeds. And those are bonuses, buybacks, and uh, BS when, when we're talking about <laughs> acronyms. So, you know, here to help however we can and super thankful to be a, a part of this conversation with Scott. Thank you. So, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the nuts and bolts. Um, you know, the big number here is the 42.45 billion, right? Uh, there's, there's other numbers, two, 2.75, 2 billion for tribal, 1 billion for middle mile, which seems, seems quite small, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we'll recall that the broadband uh, technology opportunity program, uh, program that we were chatting about a little bit earlier was almost, was, was very much focused on middle mile, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and so, so now we're getting a lot less of, of that. But um, in, in terms of the, the B, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, what, what are some of the uh, goals, Scott, that you see it, it, it accomplishing? I mean, and, and you did cover some of these like benchmarks and so forth, but, but let's just focus a little more on this. Like what, what, would, what would you and others at NTIA look back on and say, this was a successful program, you know, five, 10 years from now? What are the kind of benchmarks that you want to see come from the expenditure of these funds? That's a really good question. I think first and foremost, as mandated, the money's going to flow through the states, right? Um, so first and foremost, I would, you know, increase uh, engagement and partnership in states and the communities, um, you know, that, that, that they sit and that they serve. Um, but ultimately, we want to look back and, and we want to not address, we want to solve this issue of the digital divide. And I think anything less than that as a goal is failure, right? So this is our moonshot, if you will. We've talked about this before. Yes. Um, you know, we're really fortunate at this time that this administration and the Congress, you know, passed this historic investment. Uh, but the goal, anything other than the complete eradication of uh, digital disparities, to mm -hmm. me, is a is a failure. So is that is that a, a a lot of people hear that phrase digital divide and they think a particular type or part of the country. Like some hear that phrase and they think rural America. Mm -hmm. Others hear that phrase and they think, you know, inner cities or, or urban environments. What, what do you think of when you hear digital divide? What, what does it mean to solve that problem? So, uh, it's pervasive amongst all our communities, yeah. right? Urban, rural, right? It's, it's, it's not just an infrastructure issue. It's an access issue. It's an affordability issue. It's a workforce development issue. Um, it's a device utilization issue, it's economic development, it's everything tied in. And I think one of the things that we, we witnessed is um, the impact that COVID had, yeah. um, mm -hmm. particularly on communities who you know, were able to utilize the internet and infrastructure and technology to continue businesses, to continue operations, to continue schooling, um, and those communities that were not able to. Uh, and essentially have been left behind. And so yeah. um, I think personally, you know, I think it's embarrassing the level of inequity that exists uh, across, uh, particularly in this issue, um, but it, it has no bounds. It hits yeah. rural areas as well as it hits, you know, urban areas. Uh, and so, although the, the issues are a bit nuanced, right, mm -hmm. depending on where you are, uh, but I think the end goal, and we believe the end goal should still be the same, which is, you know, to ensure that you know, everyone has access, it's affordable. Um, and then from there spurns innovation. Um, and who knows where, you know, we're competing, you know, globally okay. for the best talent, okay. for the best opportunities. Um, and so, you know, we should make sure that all of our communities have, you know, that same access. And it, it was going to require effective partnerships and collaboration across all of the stakeholders. Jason, your comments, you mentioned the role of local providers. Talk a little bit about why that's so important to you and what broadband.money is doing to help that process along. Uh, yeah, I'll use the microphone. Uh, Go for it. Uh, first, I echo Scott and, you know, am, am super thankful to the NTIA, to you all, to, you know, building this program in a way that it's inclusive of uh, all the elements of the digital divide, right? Uh, you know, we think of the digital divide, we don't just think of the haves and the have-nots that have either access or do not. We think of the cans and the cannots, then the training 
you know, that's required. And there's, there's room for that in the program, which is awesome, right? And then there's uh, the folks that, you know, they can have all the access that they want. Maybe they live right next to gigabit fiber, uh, but that plan is a hundred bucks a month. And there's a choice of whether the family is going to, uh, you know, eat every day of the week or have a broadband plan. And uh, that's, that's not acceptable either. You know? So super thankful there. And, you know, to your question, Drew, why, why do we feel so strongly that local providers um, are really good partners to the states and to the, the groups that the states uh, recommend for the funding to, you know, carry out the uh, wishes of MTIA and its moonshot. And it's that the local providers, unlike incumbents, tend to uh, be engaged with their community as a natural function of being in that community. And, you know, daring to roll up their sleeves and to go to parts of the community where uh, national incumbent providers either you know, don't want to go or they deliberately don't go because they know that they can get paid more by not serving the area uh, than serving it, right? So local providers to us uh, with the right tools and resources, which this, this program is going to bring a lot of the tools and resources that those local providers need, you know, they're uh, equipped to go out and get the job done. So we're very passionate about that. And that's why we build tools and, and offer data and also access the capital for the uh, matching yeah. capital that is required to unlock the grants to to make sure that they have everything that they need in order to uh, you know do the application process from A to Z. Speak just a little bit more about that, Chase, if you don't mind. How sure. what what does Ready.net, which is a relatively new company, Chase, what what does it do for an ISP, and why is it so critical now? uh with this match requirement yeah so ready uh launched january of 2020 and we were thinking about where we were going to get an office <laughs> until about february of 2020 when it became clear that the world changed and that we're now living in the remote era and thus we have to make sure that everybody has access to remote services in this new era uh, so it, it multiplied the um, reasons why we were doing what we were doing which was building software and financial services that help local providers connect more people to better services, more families and businesses to get better access to broadband, which sounds silly to think that there's a software problem in any of that. But if you sit down and take a look at how uh, local providers need to do the job, they often will go out and they'll start up. And, you know, a lot of our customers, they started as they were just frustrated because their neighbors couldn't get access. And so they threw up a tower, right? right you know, or they extended a line and then, exactly. you know, they charged a little bit a month and they kept track of it on an Excel spreadsheet. And then the next thing, you know, the next walk over needed the service and then they grew and now they're sitting on 10,000 subscriber businesses and they could, and they should get to 50,000 subscribers. And well, what do they need software for At a certain point, you can't run your business on uh, duct tape and spreadsheets. Right. And we build enterprise software that helps with every aspect of finding and signing prospects through territory analysis with geospatial tools and lots of interesting data sets. And I know, Scott, you're a data head and you help the NTIA get a lot of data. And, you know, we also um, put together tools that help them manage the subscriber experience, right? So it's, it's at every step of their business and the, the subscriber journey from somebody that could get access if the local provider had the means to extend their network and to strengthen their network. Uh, all the way out to making sure that that subscriber is very happy over the long run with additional services and, and a great incumbent great experience is what we aim to offer. Right. So, and then the financial services on top of that, you know, we can help with access to capital, um, you know, having a, a good understanding of their business and the growth trajectory of the business and how they're treating their subscribers enables uh, us to be in, a, in an interesting spot to help them connect with capital providers, right? They yeah. are really interested in those types of opportunities. So it was a natural fit to, to, to help here however we can. Let's, let's actually dive back in. And if, if I could ask Ben, could, could you pull up uh, page three, if you don't mind, of Scott's presentation? Yeah. Because you have four key points here that I want to uh, ask a couple more questions about. So this is on the, the bead, again, the broadband equity access and deployment program of 42.45 billion. And you note eligible entities must, must also provide, uh, it's actually one, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's the, next uh, the next slide over, yeah. Eligible entities must also provide, um, you know, you, you note here kind of two, two high poverty areas speed of proposed network, build time, 
and a record of compliance with uh, labor and employment laws. And then you've got other key requirements. Let me just bullet point these. Mm -hmm. Quality requirements, 100 by 20 megabits per second. Matching requirements, at least 25% and less waiver granted and low cost plan requirement. So the, just, just to kind of make sure we're understanding, these rules will be spelled out by NTIA in the NOFO, right? That's correct. What is the role of states and state variation, given that the states are the ones that effectively become the grantees? That's a good question. We're in the process of, of, of working through that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get beyond so what I'm authorized to say, right? Secretary Raimondo is, uh, is leading that effort. Uh, we have a great uh, leadership team um, at Commerce, at NTIA, you know, with Assistant Secretary and then Doug Kinkoff that, lead, that leads the NTIA. Um, and so they're working on that. We're working on that collectively. You know, OIGC uh, that I'm representing here, you know, will be involved in that. Right now we're focused on outreach. Um, we want to make sure that we are uh, on the collaboration train with all of the stakeholders, right? That is going to include state uh, states, uh, state broadband offices, but it also will include local governments and communities. It will also include service providers. Um, it will also include uh, philanthropic organizations uh, and everyone in between. So uh, this is really a collective effort uh, to address this and we'll get input. And then once we get input from everyone on best practices, mm -hmm. we'll take all of that input and then we'll begin to shape uh, those requirements in the development of of, of the NOFO and the, and the application materials mm -hmm. and everything that, that flows from that. You said something earlier about 100 by 20 will be the minimum speed. Uh, but, but there's of course in the law, a section on unserved access, no access to 25.3 and underserved 100 by 20. Could you just clarify for us the confusion about, like are, are, are we going to be able to see broadband expenditures in areas that don't have 100 by 20 service and how long will they have to wait to get that expansion? Yeah, that's a good question. So these program priorities were put in the law by Congress, right? And we've got to figure out how to execute and implement implement those requirements, right? So the program priority, so targeting those locations that do not have access to 25.3, which currently is the FCC standard for broadband. Uh, but as you can see with some of the recent uh, legislation that came out over the past year with Treasury and NTIA, uh, Congress has also prioritized uh, speeds of 100 over 20, um, which is significantly you know, faster than 25 over three. Uh, but again, you know, you, depends on whom you ask, that may not be high enough, right? Uh, I think we have to understand as well that there are policy implications uh, for the speed requirement, right? For, for example, if, you, if a state or if a jurisdiction, you know, decided to do symmetrical, 100 over 100, now, now you are stating a policy goal that essentially eliminates a lot of, of technologies that aren't capable of reaching that, right? So we have to be very careful um, and making sure you know, that the uh, speeds that we're recommending, you know, Congress put the 100 over 20 as the, as the minimum, uh, but as we move forward, right, you know, what does uh, the autonomy of the states have to you know, make their own decisions on what they want, right. we have to make sure that they understand the policy implications of those decisions as well. Uh, because as we all know, um, you know, right now, speed to build, uh, everything can't be fiber. You know, there's wireless, there's microwave, there's, you know, hybrid systems. Um, so we take all of, we should take all of that into account um, in the decisions that we make. And we should be really in intentional and careful to understand, you know, the implications of, of those decisions. Uh, while at the same time, making sure that we're aggressive enough uh, to meet the demand and meet the capabilities of what's required as we Please keep them coming uh, to our remote audience as well as our in-person audience, we can recognize you. Jason Henley asks, with the lack of mapping data, how are you going to determine unserved or underserved uh, locations? And I, I should add, we did invite the FCC to be here on this program and talk a little bit about this. Sure. Uh, let me just give a 30 second explanation of the mapping uh, background. I have a follow up then... question to that question. So all right, all question, right. So. Well, and, and again, this is, this is mostly so you don't have to kind of rag on your, your sister agency, the FCC. But I would never do that. You would never do But But obviously <laughs> broadband mapping has been a, a big issue for many years. And 
the the uh, the fundamental problem is that an area is considered served when only one household receives broadband right. capabilities, uh, plus the lack of verification sometimes of the claims of providers. But but that's led to a great overstating of broadband availability. Congress has basically put its foot down, said we're not going to stand for this anymore, pass the Broadband uh, Data Collection mm -hmm. Act in uh, early 2020. And, and that, as I, as I read the, the IIJA law, uh, is going to be required, yes. right? So, so is that another kind of time frame that needs to be considered here? And let's let, get your question, Jason, on top of this question about lack of mapping data. Yeah, please. So, I mean, yes, yeah, so it, it, Congress did mandate that. The FCC is working on, on the, the new maps for that. Um, you know, luckily at NTIA, we launched our own national broadband availability map um, in 2019. Um, so we've got, I think we have a jump on and have a really good platform and idea of uh, collecting more granular data yeah. um, and overlaying that with data sets and information, you know, to really get down to the question of where broadband is and, and where it is not. Uh, right now, the program that we launched, we have, I think, 39 or almost 40 states have joined that effort um, with the NBAM. But, you know, you know, that's what we have at NTIA. Congress mandate, mandated the FCC create their own maps to uh, uh, address the uh, uh, underserved, unserved availability issue. But data collection is still and understanding where broadband is and is not is still going to be a key function. Uh, and factor no matter what we do and where we go. So whether it's on the state level, you know, programmatically, we need to understand it. You know, I think we're well positioned at NTIA to offer guidance that you know, we've been doing this now for several years and uh, we have an awesome product that uh, you know, we rely on internally and we're all constantly adding information and data layers to it uh, to really make more and better informed decisions about you know, where broadband is and, and where it's not. What we need is, you know, additional partnerships. We need uh, service providers to provide information on where their facilities are and right. speeds that they provide. And we need, you know, better demographic data, better uh, data from a, a number of different sources. And I think we can do that now, which is quite different than where we were um, 10 years ago with the BTOP program right. uh, without sort of that data and mapping and yeah, data right. collection requirement. Uh, we, we've come a long way, but we still have a, a long way to go. So it'd be interesting to see, um, you know, what the FCC comes up with. Uh, but I think we'll, we are well positioned at the NTIA to be able to uh, advise states uh, and, and, and help along with this, with this process. Chase. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why? <laughs> so knowing, Scott, that you all have such great maps, right, and you've been since 2019 gathering all the information, Right. Do we have to wait? Because uh, those areas need service and, and connectivity and affordability. And your money is going to help make that a reality. But we're waiting another six plus months on new maps that are going to restate the maps that you already have. And I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer on this, but I mean, we, we quintupled the money supply in 2020. And we're hearing about like $8 coffees, right? Already in 2021, you know? And so there is the very real risk to our nation that I love Scott, that you all framed it as your moonshot. And it's like, it's enough money with private capital and, and, and leveraging all those tools like PABS and everything that you've baked into it. It's absolutely a brilliant program. It's enough to get the job done if we get execute now, Right, but there's a real risk that we debase the currency enough that there is going to be an exponential decay in the purchasing power of that money. And that even though it's enough capital now to get the job done between the grants and the private match and the PABs, it might not be in five years. So every day in our world is like, it's, it's, it's not worth one day. It's like that movie Interstellar, we're on the planet with all the water <laughs> and the clock is ticking. You know, it's like that. It's like that. And so my question, Scott, is like, why do why do we have to wait on the FCC when you already mapped all that? So that's not how it works. <laughs> Which <laughs> I get it differently, right? So I get it. I get you know, it. Congress uh, we, we authorizes us and tells us what to do, and we have to go figure out uh, and do it. And it's not our role or responsibility to question or answer why. We just got to put our our heads down mm -hmm. and and get it done. So uh, you know, again, 
I, I can't answer that. I can only go off of what we're authorized to do right. and uh, we move forward. But you do raise some interesting points uh, of uh, you know the, the data that's available, the data that we have uh, and the implications of uh, you know the FCC's efforts to develop a mapping program to support the IIJA. Hey, it, last time around with the BTOP, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program, there was this collaborative effort between the FCC, NTIA, and the states to develop broadband maps and to, to work together on them. And it, in, in some ways, that's fallen apart a little bit. But in other ways, this program under IIJ is emphasizing the role of states even more, it seems, than previous efforts. And uh, we've got a great question from Jerry Enright, which asks, for the B, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, 25% matching requirements, does NTIA or a state grant a waiver to that 25%? So yes, that waiver will process will be outlined in the governing NOFO. Mm -hmm. So just let's talk a little bit more about matching. What, what type of matching do you envision uh, most providers who are getting funds under this program getting? Uh, you know, physical mapping, in-kind map uh, matching, mm -hmm. uh, what sources do you expect them to, to go and get matched from? Uh, traditionally, I think if you look back at our past grant programs, you know, matching generally is cash and in-kind. Um, the grant rules will generally dictate, you know, the form and the content of that match, but it's generally cash or in-kind or a combination uh, thereof. And uh, generally in the, the application and, and, and process, uh, the grant process, you have to outline and identify all those sources uh, before you commit them. So. I'm assuming that that will be a part of um, that the grant of match identification and commitment process uh, for any project uh, that moves forward. That'll be a part of the NOFO. And again, you know, the NOFO isn't done yet. We're still right. listening. We're still taking input. We still want to hear from everyone. Uh, and, uh, and there still will be a, a request for comments okay. that's forthcoming. Um, so we'll have an opportunity, hopefully, to receive input from a number of different sources before you know, the team goes and uh, and then start working on drafting and releasing uh, that NOFO. And, and can a state set higher rules? Like you were sort of alluding to this a little bit earlier. Could a state say, well, we only want symmetrical gigabit or 100 megabit symmetrical programs for the grants in that state? Or is that not permitted? I think it could. I think we're still working on the components of that, right? right. Every state is different. Like if you look at, for example, Georgia um, recently just completed a statewide mapping you right. know, component and mm -hmm. program. Um, there are a number of different states that have completed theirs and they're in operation. And then there are some states that are quite frankly, just getting started, right? Yeah. And so it's gonna be, you know, that vast, uh, you know, diaspora that we have to work with between states that are, you know, rapidly, uh, you know, have field staff, have technical assistance capabilities, already collect data, you know, maybe have a really good understanding uh, of the communities and there are going to be states that don't right so our job in this process um, is to ensure that you know we're shepherdizing all of the right partnerships and collaborations so that that information and, and data uh, uh, sharing and program priorities and all of that is reflected in uh, in what we do mm -hmm. uh, we got an in-person question so go ahead and uh, why don't you uh, grab the pass the microphone to our, our guest please identify yourself so these people can hear hear you. Yes, uh, good afternoon. This is a fascinating panel. Great, great discussion. I'm John Bird with Miller One Hope Capital Strategies in Fairfax City, Virginia. And uh, I guess a quick point, uh, follow up on Drew's original question on the lead process mm -hmm. and how this, the grant money uh, perspective is different states and how different states obviously uh, move forward with, with moving the grants. Um, that's going to be really important when it comes to the actual uh, following state licensing law, such as the professional service of mapping itself. It says the grants, grant money goes for each state. Each state defines what survey and mapping and geospatial is differently from one state to the next. And there are state licensing boards that follow that very strictly. So that's going to be incredibly helpful uh, as, you, as you continue to move forward. My question would be, um, number one, the great progress that you, you've made have been very inclusive, to my understanding, bringing in other federal agencies outside of FCC and RUS into the fold. Um, can you maybe discuss some of the examples or partnerships with other federal agencies or state and local units of government as far as their mapping efforts? Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more kind of uh, 
in the detail there, Scott. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. I would add to your point about state uh, requirements. Also, uh, utilization of diverse suppliers is going to be really key and important as well as we as we walk through this. And I know that's not something that's normally you know highlighted or talked about, but it's still going to be very important um, as we talk about the opportunities that exist. You know, we want to ensure. Uh, I think any program would want to ensure, any state would want to ensure that they're maximizing opportunities for. Uh, businesses in okay. their states, including, you know, diverse uh, businesses, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, etc. So we have to ensure that as well. Uh, one of the charges we have at NTIA is we've uh, been charged with the, the interagency process, interagency partnership process. We've been doing that for several years. Uh, it started under BTOP. It's transitioned now uh, across several administrations. But the idea is that uh, we need increased and better coordination between and among federal agencies, uh, particularly the ones who uh, make grants to uh, states and individuals for broadband access and digital inclusion. So we have a team at NTIA and OIGC that's been leading that effort um, with RUS, with FCC, uh, EDA, uh, and a number of different agencies. We also chair a number of multi-stakeholder uh, groups. The State Broadband Leaders Network uh, is one where we bring forth all of the state broadband directors uh, to share best practices, right, including mapping, right, uh, participation in the National Broadband uh, Mapping Program in BAM, National Broadband Availability Map uh, is a component of that. Um, we also have a digital inclusion leaders network that we launched a couple of years ago, bringing together uh, digital inclusion practitioners, uh, local government and community, uh, digital inclusion and equity practitioners. So. We've done a lot in this area, and the idea is just around collaboration and bringing forth better ideas, sharing best practices, because, you know, we're not under the guise that the federal government can do it all. All right, so that would be a misnomer. So if anyone leaves here thinking, you know, NTIA, this little agency of commerce can, can do all of this on its own, that's not the case, right? We're going to need, I think we've established really good effect, effective partnerships uh, we're seeking uh, even more collaboration as we move forward. But the idea is the more that we can share information, the more we can remove barriers, uh, the more we can make the processes, particularly dealing with the federal government, easier, more streamlined, more consistent, then the better we can uh, you know, achieve in implementing these programs and making sure that we're not throwing money. You know, this agency is invested in here, so you know, we don't need to invest there. What we need is better investment in there right, to make sure it's it's targeted to uh, address the issues that it's designed to issue. So we have collaboration of partners across the federal government um, and, and across the uh, uh, the nation as well in uh, other organizations. So it's a lot. So we got about 10 minutes left. We want to keep inviting your questions online or here in person, um, but I want to spend a couple minutes on other programs besides infrastructure, particularly Digital Equity Act, mm -hmm. and also the Connecting Minority Communities, right? And, and again, um, given your, your key role on that, I, I wonder if you'd share with us, Scott, a little bit about um, what lessons you've learned as you've seen the application start to come in on the Connecting Minority Communities. What, what do you mm -hmm. hope will come from, from that program? That's a great question. I, I get fired up about that. I have a great team uh, that we worked on in launching this program. I, th I think it's humbling in, in this position in that there's so much need out there, uh, particularly when you talk to uh, school administrators. And you know, I don't know about all of you, you know, I keep a, a track of, of my alma mater. And you know, during COVID, you know, they flipped the switch and you know, kids had laptops and professors knew how to uh, teach on uh, virtual platforms. And yeah, it was a pain, but they got through it, right? Uh, through this CMC process, the Connecting Minority Communities pilot program, you know, we've learned that there are a significant number of schools, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions. They just don't have the ability to flip the switch and, right. and, and have that. And so you have a, a whole class of student, uh, both uh, of, you know, of, of, of minority and non-minority students, you know, that are it's kind of lost a year of school because they didn't have a laptop or their school didn't have the infrastructure to be able to 
you know, digitize all of their, their classwork. And so from that standpoint, the CMC is designed to address that issue, um, particularly with the uh, higher education community, HBCUs, TCUs, uh, and MSIs, but to a greater extent, the communities in which they sit and serve. So are there abilities to do digital equity and access and training uh, into the community, offer different certifications, um, not just for the students, but also for uh, the community members? Because oftentimes these institutions are the lifeblood of where they sit and serve. They're the economic driver, they're the social driver, um, you know, they're the driver of anything you want to name that institution um, is, is going to drive that. So we're excited about um, the opportunity, but it's also we understand that the $268 million is not enough to address the collective need that's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we hope this serves as a foundation. We can launch some really successful projects, uh, but then ultimately, you know, make this a, a, a fully funded program and then we can address this need amongst uh, all of our institutions of higher education. Are the, are the connecting minority communities um, applications more infrastructure focused or more kind of application and use focused? Uh, it's more on the digital inclusion access. Um, it has an infrastructure component in that if a school needs to increase its capacity, increase the infrastructure, the bandwidth, the pipe, if you will, right. to its institution, it can do that if it wants to expand, um, you know, internet access and Wi-Fi capabilities on its campuses and the classroom. It can do that as well, but the goal is to ensure that um, the the schools, the institutions, they have the capacity uh, and the training, right? The, yeah. the IT training and staff that they need, cybersecurity, all of those things that are important to to run uh, and facilitate educational uh, investment and learning. Uh, those things that make sure that you know these schools have that opportunity, right? Because we're still dealing with COVID, right? Right, students are still, um, you know, remote, and and let's be honest, right? Even as we move forward, you know, remote learning instruction, uh, you know, still will be a part of, you know, how we learn and how we Absolutely. remove uh, geographic barriers to learning as we move forward. So it's going to be very important that we continue to do that, and uh, I'm I'm excited about it. I'm just it's kind of melancholy in that we can't. Uh, we won't be able to fund every great application right. that comes you through. You got a lot more than you, and you just can't tell us how much more, right? But, but I can't, I can't. But, 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 we, but we'll, we will we'll wait soon. for the press release. It is it's nothing to be excited about. It is it is true a real time demonstration of the need that's there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask both uh, Scott and Jace a question about letters of support, right. and and as it applies to to both these type of grants, mm -hmm. the uh, digital equity. Uh, connecting minority communities, even tribal, but also to the other ones, the bead uh, that we spent most of our time talking about. What role do letters of support play and, and how should applicants be thinking about that right now? So I think we've transformed, uh, at least with the CMC uh, and the grant programs, letters of support aren't required, right? But we're basing it off of, at least in the CMC, it's the greatest unmet financial need um, that we're going to provide an analysis of based on the information that uh, the, the applicants uh, submit to us. Uh, I think that you, the more you get better data and information and you know how to quantify and classify need, you know, less reliance on, you know, subjective letters of support. You know, it's letters of commitment are going to be good, you know, needed for like project partners. Credit. Uh, no, letters of commitment for identified project partners. So if okay. I'm submitting an application and I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to use Jace and Jace is going to do this, Jace is going to submit a letter and say, absolutely, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be responsible for. These are the funds that I'm going to commit, you know, letters of commitment to support the project, not necessarily letters of support. Now, again, I'm speaking, you know, a little bit out of turn here because That's again, great. we, this is great. <laughs> you know, again, this is to be, to be seen, uh, at, at least with the, the uh, guidance that's coming forth. I can talk about the CMC. We did not require letters of support, although applicants did submit them, uh, but we did not require letters of support and will not make decisions based on uh, a letter of support or lack thereof. It's really about the need. It's about the commitment. And the it's commitment about the impact that someone's the willing to support Absolutely. you. Chase, what are some of your thoughts on this? I know you've talked a lot about forward receivables as a way to structure. Oh, yeah, that's a mechanism for matching capital. But I think, you know, the, the updates to the um, you know, devices aside, like, I think one of the more brilliant things about the, the new program that y'all created is that, you know, there's a 
an attention to community partnership, right? And, and, and in a sense, like we interpret it as like, there's a community sourcing that goes on. Like the, the part of the diligencing process, like it's quantifiable uh, objective need and you can, uh, you know, have a harder time gaming that if you're an incumbent that's trying to come in and, and do something like uh, what they've done in historic programs, you can see the community saying, well, you know, for the last, you know, this many years, we've been ignored by provider XYZ, uh, but, you know, provider ABC helps us, right, and is committed, right? So um, we don't know if, you know, exactly how the rules are going to fall, like Scott said, on the, the device, the specifics of it, but the intention, we think, is very powerful. And, and, and necessary, but you know, to your question of forward receivables, like that, that is a really interesting mechanism for providers that are looking for other capital sources and uh, equity letters of credit, the, all the all the contraptions that you need to, you know, uh, bring to the table to show that you have the financial um, support and backing and balance yeah. sheet to actually pull off what you commit to pulling off. So, so Jace, what what advice would you give to people using broadband money as as a way to learn about and actually oh, organize yeah. partnerships? What what can people expect to find on broadband? Yeah, to to Scott's point, like a big part of this is education, and uh, we're launching uh, next month. We're launching this community discuss broadband money. You can go get a sneak preview of it today, but it's chock full of resources. We have folks that sit around and and read the latest and greatest that, that try to track with the journey of of uh, the laws as they get written, and you know, uh, you know, collaborate, bring together state leaders and officials, and bring together folks from the provider community, from the uh, matching capital community, and and even some anchor institutions that are starting to sign up to, you know, be a part of the conversation about helping to shape the money. And we do have um, a bias, um, and it's towards local providers local, and local, and local partnerships. To, you know, big big uh, c companies that may not be willing to or invest in the communities for the long haul. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, we're, we're, we're coming towards the end here. Let me, let me actually read one final question we have from our audience and then uh, use to sort of springboard uh, final statements by each of you. Will the NTA monitor the distributed monies and usage to ensure the funds are distributed where most effective or leave it to the states to decide, I, you know, lo love your thoughts on that, and and uh, and please feel free to give us, uh, you know, maybe some some closing words as well, Scott. Okay. No, that's a great question, and, and we're working through the the you know parameters of what that may look like. Uh, do we is reliance on the states, or do we what oversight role will NTI yeah. have? Uh, you know, I'm probably leaning more towards uh, oversight, making sure that yeah. states are adhering to um, the program priorities. Um, of the program. Um, and, and then just final thoughts is, you know, I think this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for our country to address uh, an issue. Um, and it only will happen if we work together. Uh, and we are uh, actively, you know, facilitating uh, and, and advocating for collaborative partnerships. We're launching uh, a listening tour. I think it launches on December 15th. Uh, stay tuned for our website for that for that information. Nice. Uh, you know, we'll be doing outreach. We'll be conducting uh, outreach. I know Secretary uh, Ramondo has been speaking. Doug has been speaking to to, to groups. Uh, NTIA and Commerce uh, leadership have been you know speaking to to groups. And you know, we're going to try to talk to as many uh, groups and stakeholders that we can. You know, all the way from community groups, uh, you know, to trade associations, to service providers, because we believe. So this is our opportunity to get this right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we are committed to doing everything that we can to ensure that, that we get this right for the American public, that we are great stewards of the taxpayer funds. Um, and then most importantly, that we get the outcomes and the impact that we all want, which is the elimination of uh, the digital chasm right. um, in, uh, across the communities in our country. So that's, that's our overarching goal as we move forward. Well, thank you so much. Jay's final thoughts from you on implementing the IIJA Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I would just go back to what Scott said in the very beginning. There's lots of work to do <laughs> and let's get a move on. Let's go, Yeah. let's help however we can. So, well, thank you. Uh, but before we close, I wanna uh, give a, a great uh, thanks to um, 
uh, all of those uh, who have attended uh, remotely or in person, as well as to uh, our sponsors at Broadband Breakfast and remind everyone that we will be online again next Wednesday, December 15th. We've got a very another very exciting session on public-private partnerships with participation from Jim Baller of Keller Heckman, uh, Roger Timmerman, CEO of Utopia Fiber, and folks from Allo Fiber as well. That'll be 12 noon Eastern time on December 15th. On behalf of Scott Woods, thank you so much for being thank with you. us. Jace Wilson, thank you as well for being with us. I'm Drew Clark with Broadband Breakfast, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Take care.